Welcome back to the Evolving Warfighter. Um, I'm Dr. Franklin Annis, and today I'm joined uh, with a dear guest, uh, Ryan Driscoll. He recently uh, started up a Stoic podcast, and it came to my attention uh, just simply because of the quality of individuals that he had been uh, interviewing along his way. So I wanted to invite him on to talk about uh, his experiences with Stoicism in the military, uh, and more importantly, kind of what he's trying to do with his project and who he's trying to reach. So thank you for being with me today. Hey, thanks for having me, Franklin. So uh, why don't we start by, uh, I'll give you a chance to kind of introduce yourself a little more and kind of explain how you got interested in Stoicism. Okay. Well, I guess I'll just start with my military experience leading up into this project, if that works for you. Yes. All right. So... I did the typical enlisted thing and joined the military right out of high school. But unlike a lot of people, I kind of knew what I wanted to do before I joined. I was in high school JRTC and the JRTC instructor was all about Rangers. So I got a Ranger infantry contract. And what that means is it guarantees an option to go there. It like gives you the ability to go to the selection process. So I went to basic training, airborne, RASP is what it was called, Ranger Assessment Selection Program, made it through that. Got to the unit, did a couple of years on the line, a couple of deployments. Uh, but then that's where my story is a little bit different than a lot of people that come out of special operations. A, it was short, and then B, I had a failure within my time in the service in which I ended up washing out of the line. And it wasn't until years later when I was out of the military that I realized that I had a medical issue that made it much, much more difficult for me in which my inner ear essentially doesn't work. And it, it really wasn't even until I went to Vanderbilt in the last couple of years that they were like, oh, you have the most hypo-functioning vestibular system of anyone we've seen your age. And what that means for a normal person going about their daily life isn't really much because I compensate for it with my vision and my ability to feel the ground. But when your whole job is doing offset infiltrations through the mountains of Afghanistan with 70 pounds of kit at night, you know, on top of doing your job, it is a complication that makes things a little bit harder. And not not to say that was all of it, because, you know, hindsight being twenty twenty and being an older man now, it's easy to look back on that and say, you know, there were a ton of things I could have done differently to rectify that situation. But it is what it is. And ultimately, that hurdle was a little too much for me at the time. So I did the next two years of my contract in the sports side within regiment did a couple more deployments, got out. And then getting out of the military, I experienced several, I don't know if the, the term would be pathological, like negative, just you know, bad thinking essentially, that made my life a lot harder than it needed to be. And it wasn't until years of talking to other veterans that I realized that it wasn't just me that felt this way. So essentially the two things that were bothering me the most were the kind of lack of community when you get out of the military in which it's hard to explain, but if anyone's ever gotten out of the military or maybe you can experience it with the guard, you know, you go from a very tight knit group of people where you all kind of think the same, you're all moving in the same direction, wearing the same uniform. So even if you're not, you don't think the same on every little issue, you're still part of this cohesive group. So whenever you leave, you are all on your own. And I know that the transitioning programs in the military try and tell you, you know, try and prep you a little bit for that. But I think they kind of say that out of one side of the mouth and the other side of the mouth, they say you're a special and unique person and somebody owes you something, at least in my experience. And telling people that they are that special and unique person that is owed something is really setting them up for failure. Because the other end of the spectrum that was holding me back, you know, in hindsight, again, now that I've gotten to the point I am now and realize is that I had my identity all tied up with being a soldier. So, you know, I got out and I had several really kind people give me great opportunities. And I've had these great jobs since I've gotten out uh, just on the merits of who I was and been able to succeed in that. But even though I had these good jobs and I was succeeding in them, I still had this itch in the back of my head where I felt like what I was doing wasn't meaningful. And it wasn't worthwhile. I didn't know why I was doing it. I really felt like, and what I kept getting pulled back to whenever I get in these negative states of minds was, oh, well, I should go do something with a gun again. Like I should be a 
police officer, I should be a you know Blackwater contractor, do something like that. And after years of of going through those kind of cycles of being you know r wanting to run away and join the circus is how I used to phrase it to my wife. You know, uh, I had a good ranger buddy of mine ask me. He was like, "Man, what do you really want?" And it caused me to be really introspective. And what I realized was that I just wanted to feel satisfied with myself and what I'm doing. It wasn't necessarily that I wanted to do a specific job. Is at the time that I contacted him, I was really contemplating leaving a good job to start a gun range with somebody and be a firearms instructor. And after that, you know, it's ironic or maybe just providential or coincidental that he kind of put me on that thought process. And then I stumbled across stoicism. I was using Sam Harris's meditation app. And in there, there's a segment by Bill Irving in which he lays out stoic meditations. And besides, you know, the little segue that mindfulness meditation is also really useful. I just found that everything about the stoic uh, practices that he was explaining really jived with kind of my constitution already and how I already thought. So once I started practicing it, I saw so much benefit in my life that I got interested in the theory and it kind of became this revolving door, you know, of exponential benefit where I would practice more, I'd study more and my life kept getting better and better to the point where, you know, right now my job, it can be extremely stressful at times and it helps me with my job. It helps me with my relationships, with my family, with my friends. And I mean, all around, you know, I, I don't want to overhype this, you know, experiences may vary, but for me, it really almost gave me a second lease on life in terms of moving forward in a really positive direction. And what I couldn't help but think as I was going through this more and more, there were really two different things as it pertains to the military, because, you know, obviously, even if you only do four or five years, if you're deploying, doing things like that, I mean, it really flavors or, set, you know, it's a, a critical moment in your life. So it's hard to forget all of that or not keep take that with you into the rest of your life. And I, I kept thinking two things. And one was, is this ethical system applicable to the military? And the second thing was, there's so much in this that is useful for everyone, but more than just everyone. I mean, it is, I feel uniquely set up to help people in really complex, high stress environments. So I didn't see anything going on within the military community about this. And uh, ironically, the Stoicon X military event came out right before I started the podcast and which you spoke at. So there were unbeknownst to me, there were pieces moving in the background, but before I knew that I reached out to some of the stoic fellowship people because I actually run a group here in Nashville that meets in person. Um, and they were like, well, there's a couple of different people we can put you in contact with. And one of them was Leonidas uh, Konstantikos, who I interviewed the first was the first person I interviewed. And when I was talking to him, I was like, hey, man, do you know of any groups where, you know, people with combat experience or just veterans in general talk about these issues? Because generally, I just hear scholars talking about it and they don't have any experience with deploying or serving in combat arms units, things like that. And he was like, no, man, I, I don't, but you should do it. And I was like, well, that's not my question, but uh, I guess I'll do it. Uh, and, you know, for me, it wasn't something that I was super excited about, you know, like going back and dredging up my military experience and being public about it isn't something that was exciting to me at the time. But again, I just, I felt like I was in such a unique position having this passion for the philosophy and also understanding the veteran community and the wartime experience that I kind of had a duty to talk about it because it's been so useful for me and I think it can help a lot of people. So I felt drawn that I, I had to do something. I had to, to speak to people about this. And, you know, fortunately, I've been really lucky with a lot of scholars like yourself, Leonidas, uh, Dr. McElhern, and there's been a lot of good information I think I've been able to put out there. Yeah, you covered a lot of ground there, but yes, you're absolutely right in the fact that I greatly enjoy listening to your podcast and the information I've been able to, to pull out of a lot of your interesting guests. So one of the Thank things you. you talked about there was kind of this um, you know, dimensional aspect of being a soldier. So along the way somewhere, 
in the 20th century, it seems like we've lost connection to kind of the larger, uh, what I would say, kind of the warrior tradition. So uh, people are philosopher kings, they're warrior poets. It was being a, a soldier was one aspect of being a much larger, and I, I'll use the word man, but much larger human. And it's, um, it's interesting that the more I go back and study kind of historical Stoic texts or even just the great works of Western uh, literature, I see a lot more of that referencing of the, the larger identity building inside those stories. And I was wondering, did Stoicism help you understand kind of the aspect of being with a being a warrior and then kind of the larger larger connection of how you can find identity that connects the warriorness but doesn't doesn't drive you to hyper focus on that that well not to use like overused terms but that hyper um uh machismo type of characteristic that we sometimes think about it yeah you know like a lot of people that find stoicism and talk about it later in life, I regret that I didn't have it earlier. So I, all of my thinking about the military and stoicism is through my experience, like applying, looking at my memories and my experience there and retroactively applying this. So unfortunately, I didn't have this when I was in the service. I think things would have been a little bit different for me, definitely in the way I managed situations and the way I conceptualized them and, you know, attributed moral value to external situations that were uh, outside of my control, but I don't know. I mean, it, it's an, it's an interesting question. I think that looking at it now, and I'm also older, I do think that stoicism provides room for thinking about yourself as a role. And that was one of the key things that helped me separate my identity from anything related to the military type experience where, you know, there's a middle stoic, Anitus, who Cicero quotes, and he lays out four roles in this role ethic system in which, number one, you're a human being, and your role is to live in accordance with virtue or nature, as the Stoics would say. And then two, there's your individual nature, your ability to do a certain thing. I mean, if you're, you know, four foot tall and sickly, you're not going to play in the NBA. And then there's your circumstantial roles or societal roles, and then your, your career. So being able to separate who you are from what you do, I think, is critical for anybody. I mean, it's, it's really critical for the military because at any point you could be injured and taken out of the fight. And, and then you're just immediately done with that stage of your life. So, but then even in the civilian world, any, any career, any sort of thing like that, if you stake who you are to your title or your career, someone can take that from you. You know, so you're giving fate an opportunity to have control over you. But if your identity is tied up in who you are and how you behave, then that's always under your control. I mean, it's it really is freedom. You're free from fate because you you always are in control of the next thing that you do. I mean, obviously, sometimes we overreact impulsively or uh, if you're conditioned to a certain response, you might act a certain way. But we can choose how we ascribe judgment values to these things. And with practice, you get better and better at not acting impulsively. So does, does that answer your question? Yes, I think it did. Um, so another interesting part that you broke up was specific, or brought up was specifically trying to find individuals that come out of the warrior culture and have experience. So I guess it's been, well, it's been over a year. I'll just say about two years that I've been working with the Stoic community trying to, well, find other interesting military Stoics and then uh, trying to build a resiliency type plan or find one out there that would really work to help soldiers. And uh, one of the, the most interesting things I've noted is in the larger Stoic community, and I don't want to begrudge anyone, but I think that certain aspects of stoicism has become really commercialized so you see some authors writing very much to sell to the mainstream i you know i'm not going to begrudge anyone for trying to sell books and make money and make a living off of it because we all have to make a living um, but i think that th there's a community of authors that are writing in that context that it becomes very very hard for them to interact with a 
kind of a more noble or aspect of kind of the military stoicism goal in terms of hey we really just want a product that works we're not too much interested in at building profits but more importantly we need the author or the scholar to not necessarily have gone to war because i think that's something that opportunity or fate presents us but having tested themselves went through kind of the military community or service community and had been at one point of their lives knowing that their lives was at risk. So whether they never got the call to go to war or go out and be a police officer, but they had trained and believed themselves to adapt that role. And I think that that background experience really shapes the way you, you approach the larger aspects of life. And I think it's, um, to some degree far less polished where you you're more accepting of kind of the grayness of the world if you've you know ever been out on the you know in a combat site you you know things aren't black and white they're not perfect you don't have time to think about it so it's kind of more forgiving more accepting of um, kind of the realistic nature of things um, but i guess my question here to you is have you noticed well i think you've selected um, quite a remarkable group of people to talk to so far. But have you noticed talking to people that are outside the military context or military experience um, about stoicism versus those that have kind of the, the experience of being a soldier first, do you see a, kind of a major break between um, how they approach the philosophy and how useful it is? That's an interesting question. Uh, you know, so first off, the philosophy community is really small. So the kind of people that would be interested in military or civilian is, is pretty small. And I don't, I don't have a ton of people that I served with that I'm close with, but the handful of people that I am, that I still, you know, am in contact with, I'm very close to. So they've expressed interest because they're good brothers and they're trying to give it a fair shake and, you know, give me some feedback. Um, in terms of the difference, I don't know. I mean, so I run this meetup group, the Nashville Stoics here, and I do think that we, I don't pull any punches, you know, I'll just talk about the military ideas around killing people and, or at least popular conceptions around, you know, thinking like that. And, you know, we'll talk about death and things like that. And I think those principles are really universal. And if you, whether you're in the military or you're a civilian, if you come to it genuinely from a perspective of, I want to improve my character and be the best that I can be, then I think that there's a lot of overlap there. Um, and I'm, it might just be that my experience dealing with veterans that are interested in this is so limited that I can't give a good comparison. But I will say that with the people that come regularly to the meetup here in Nashville, when we get into, like I said, talking about death, talking about all these real issues that apply across the board. And um, so far I've gotten a lot of feedback that's been really helpful. Yeah, well, it's great. It, you know, I would love to have the opportunity to actually have an in-person Stoic community to, to go hang out with. That that would be truly a blessing to anyone's life, I think. Yeah, it's been a blessing for me, for sure. So you've now you've interviewed a number of uh, kind of military Stoics and philosophers, um, scholars so far. I think you have maybe eight or more interviews so far. Um, six. Six. Uh, so out of those six, has there been kind of a, uh, kind of a standout moment that something really hits you from engaging in your podcast? I would say there's been several. And as you know, because you've listened to my podcast, it, there's different flavors to different kinds of episodes. Like when I spoke to you, we were very much, you know, historical and looking at the broader context of philosophy. Because I, I'm interested in that as much as the application. And you have a really interesting, inspiring story that we could have just had a whole conversation about practical application stuff, but, you know, we went a different direction. So for me, I'd say there's been a handful of things. One, I mean, it's been personally gratifying is just validating some of the ideas I had around, you know, the that people have their identity tied up with the military, and that's a big issue. You know, talking to uh, Roger Johnston, who runs the Vet Center in Maui, and I just recently spoke to Dr. Megan McElhern, who you connected me with. And there, there were several interesting ideas there. So the one about the, separating our identity is a big one. I made some notes because you, you mentioned that to me. 
uh, one thing that Roger said that really stood out to me was he was like, being in the military is kind of a celebrity status that most people are never going to experience again. And that really, I, I didn't like dwell on it in the moment, but I chewed on that for a while afterwards. And I couldn't help but agree with that. It's like, yeah, I mean, you know, in the, the job that I was in, in regiment, I mean, you never got fanfare. You came back from deployment and they'd call your wife 24 hours before. And then you, they'd pick you up and you might already be drunk and then you go home. <laughs> so it, it was never like walking through a public airport and people are like throwing flowers to you and shit like that. Um, but they're still in your mind was like, yeah, you know, I'm a warrior for this country and I'm special. So, you know, that, that is an interesting co concept that I think that a lot of people would do well to kind of come to grips with and get over. Um, another concept is the idea of post-traumatic growth that you don't really hear much about. People just talk all the time about trauma and how it's going to stick with you forever. And I mean, to a degree, it will, depending on the level of the trauma. But even if it sticks with you, it can be a growth opportunity. It can be something that doesn't define you, but is part of your development as a person. And, you know, I could say the cheesy line that everyone says where it's like, if I could go back and change my actions, you know, I want it because who I am today is someone I'm happy with. So all the pain that I've experienced leading up to who, where I am right now, I, you know, I want to change. And I think that people do well to have some sort of training in the management of trauma, which you alluded to earlier. And then another thing that has come up over and over again is just the importance of community which, you know, a lot of times whenever you leave the military, you have your close-knit group of guys that you'll probably stay in contact with. But I don't know if that's good enough. I mean, it, unless you're really communicating with them regularly, just having periodic touch, touching base with people, I think as humans, we need more community than that. Um, and one of the things that Roger said that really stuck with me also was that leaving the tribe or being excommunicated, whichever, or getting jolted from it, is similar to like a natural threat reaction for human beings because I mean prior to living in these modern jungles that modern you know concrete jungles that we live in if you were out there with your tribe and you for whatever reason were isolated from them I mean there's a very legitimate threat to your life you know someone's gonna eat you so it makes sense that whenever you are separated from the military that you're gonna experience some negative emotions around that and I know for me you know, like I said, I, I dealt with some pretty serious negative emotions getting out of the military, periodically depression, and then at, at the end, anxiety to a certain extent. And one of the things that Roger was saying was that, like I said, those, those are natural reactions. Uh, so maybe, again, like I, I don't know how to can these answers and create something that's like a, a product that you can just hand out to people, but people would do well to understand that they need to get involved in the community. You know, stoicism is big on self-reliance, but it's not big on individualism. So community is critical, but, you know, at the same time, being able to rely on yourself is important. Yes. So great, great points there. And I can actually say kind of, from my previous experience in the National Guard, I understand kind of how being separated can be really detrimental. Um, I think it's kind of unique to the Guard and Reserves. When we come back from a deployment, a lot of us go back to our families and we can be spread pretty geographically across across states or nations from our, our previous battle buddies from our units we just got deployed with. And I'm quite sure you know, like, hey, if your life is falling apart, you, you tend not to talk over the telephone with that. So just having someone that you could talk face to face with is so much different than saying, hey, you can call me. It's like, well, you don't have, you typically don't have those serious conversations over the phone. Or if you find a veteran that's falling apart that's willing to talk over the phone, it's really bad because it's like, hey, you need to find someone to get over there right now to take care well, of this and there, That brings up another point, sorry to interrupt you, yeah. but the, again, the last two people I spoke to because it's most fresh in my mind, Roger and Megan, both of their therapy groups are based on group. So they both have active participants in a group relating to each other and both express how important that is to the process because there's such a stigma in the community of going to a therapist, which that going to a therapist and speaking to a professional separate than a group is a great idea if you're dealing with something. But 
you know, again, to reinforce what I was saying earlier about the importance of some form of community or just, you know, like a, not necessarily a huge community, but just like a group of people that you are actually interacting with and relating to is really important. Yeah. Well, I think a, a lot of that's true in the fact that a lot of people suffer individually not knowing how common things are. And if we understood how common reactions were, then we wouldn't worry so much because we, I think we naturally, if we experience something, we just naturally want to either blame ourselves or say, hey, this is worse for me than anyone else. Or I shouldn't, I shouldn't be feeling this emotion because John isn't feeling the emotion. However, if I mm -hmm. talk to John once a week in a, a little counseling group, then I find out John's having the exact same thing. So then, then maybe I can normalize what I'm going through and, you know, figure out, you know, among friends, like what works for you, what doesn't work for you, um, how does this get better? But I, I definitely agree that the, well, it goes down to our biology, right? We are, we're pack animals fundamentally. So anytime you separate humans from other communities, they, they tend to suffer tremendously psychologically. And uh, I think one of the, the big faults um, even with the VA dis uh, disabilities compensation for wounded veterans is um, sometimes the system provides enough resources for severely disabled veterans that they, they separate themselves because they no longer need jobs. And it, you know, the amount of resources or types of resources provided actually can push individuals away from society instead of you know, pulling them back and saying, hey, we're going to Instead of paying you 100% VA disabilities, we're only going to give it to you if you, you know, do X amount of, you know, community work or volunteer work, whether it's, you know, saying hello to people at tours just to get you, you know, always connected back in the community, build relationships. And uh, what's, it's interesting to think like the, having a job is like the second leading indicator for happiness in life. And it's not necessarily like going in and doing work but it's you know if you don't show up for for work today just knowing that someone will pick up the phone and be like hey ryan are you okay why aren't you here you know mm -hmm. and you know we get too separated then we we lose all those those connections or caring or outreach the pull is coming back into the community yeah and something you know people throughout the conversations that i've had have talked about the idea of different programs that could be implemented and you know, it's all very complex. It's complex in how you would can it, how you would like sell it to the military. Because if you're like, hey, I got the stoic philosophy thing, they're gonna be like, listen, we already got Islam and Christianity and Judaism. We don't need another religion. Um, so, I mean, it's it's all tricky in how you present it. But one thing I was thinking about in terms of therapy is, I wonder if there wouldn't be u utility in just taking everyone coming back from a deployment or everyone trans transitioning out of the military and making them talk to a therapist, because then it destigmatizes it where people don't have to feel like, oh, well, I'm going to take the initiative and go speak to a therapist. You just get a five minute exit interview and they, they can prescribe you like, all right, just come back to sick call. Just tell them you're coming to sick call for something else. And, you know, we can talk about it. See, and that's kind of the hard thing to do because so, you know, I, I work very closely with, you know, individuals making those type of decisions for the military. But it's the question of like, every redeployment requirement for a soldier adds time to separate between yeah, them right. and their family. Like when I came back home, I had a severely injured hand and like, I should have probably st stayed around, had surgery on my hand. But I knew that if you say, Hey, my, my hand isn't healing, then I have to stay at a base for another three months versus, Hey, I, I can go back to my family. And then the next day I'll go check in with my local doc. So um, I agree with you. We have to find a way to do it. I just don't know. It's like the mandatory check mark is hard in, in that. You're right. Way. And then it's money and time and everything else, like you said. That was just me oh, know, yeah, yeah. throwing a random thought out there. Well, I, it's good to kind of think and debate and question. And this is kind of my bigger question, really, when I always think about, like, introducing stoicism to the military. I know that Dr. Uh, McAlloran has a wonderful program, especially the way it's structured in terms of it introduces the theory without necessarily all the historical references and baggage so you don't get caught up with kind of the academic part. But really what we're talking about is a philosophy. So it's, even though we might frame it and say, hey, we're Stoics, both of us individually engaged with Stoic thoughts or the philosopher's thoughts and we had to make up our mind, like, 
are we accepting this? Are we not accepting it? So you're debating it. So any really can program can't can't really make people adapt a way of thinking. And even if to some degree trying to approach it in a structured way might not even be the best. But and this comes back to maybe your small groups are the best type of way to build stoic communities because it's the honest discussion. It's the debate. You know. Do I believe Marcus Aurelius here? Was he right? Was he wrong? Does it still apply in the 21st century? Yeah, and I'm, I'm, I mean, I, uh, you know, I just want to caveat everything I say in terms of practical solutions. That this is all me just thinking out loud, <laughs> and you know, I, I don't spend all day. I have a day job, so it's not like I'm mapping out how this would be applicable. But and to touch back on what you're saying about there's a lot of canned authors out there that are taking stoic ideas and selling them to the mainstream. Well, I think that if you were going to take some sort of system to apply it to the military, it would need to be like before operational stress that Megan is, or Dr. McElroy is working on, um, in which it's a therapy or psychology program. It isn't a philosophy program, even though it's undergirded by stoicism or you would need to take a more canned answer in applying it in terms of these are a bunch of mind hacks or these, this, these are like a mental armament for going into battle and dealing with high stress situations to improve your performance in, in combat. And then I would think that that would be the segue into, if you find value in this, these are the core text, you know, but you're right. I mean, you can't, uh, there's no way I could see in the U S them being like, all right, we're all going to sit around and open Marcus Aurelius together and read this. Well, it's interesting. You brought up theology there too, because inside stoicism, there's a fundamental discussion of theology, whether it's depending on which stoic you, you look at sometimes it's small and sometimes it's quite huge, but stoicism, much like any other philosophy gets tied up into, there's a certain aspect where you have to deal with the concept of a God or fate, like, you know, is there one God or several gods, that type of that conversation. And that, even with the, uh, well, I think it's kind of unique inside the United States with the First Amendment, but it's uh, it's like spiritualism is considered one of the components of resiliency for a U.S. Army soldier, but the instruction around spirituality is, is so... Um, like a minefield to try to walk through for the army so it's like hey we recognize we need it like we have to have the discussion we just don't know how to do it without you know it being perceived that we're forcing religion on people or you'll have the one atheist object and say we shouldn't talk about god at all versus you know you know and it's like how how can you invite several different religions to all kind of inter interface and engage in like kind of free open conversation so complex and I, i've engaged with several people with this conversation and you're right. I mean, you couldn't have, I don't think that at least not in the recent near future, you couldn't have a stoic chaplain, but I, I do think that it's possible provided the right framing to have some sort of philosophical counselor or maybe call it a therapist that is using the basis of CBT or stoic principles. But you're right. I mean, I know for me, I didn't believe in God when I was in the army and, uh, you know, I kind of had pretty, typical like indignant attitude and you know irreverent and even though the chaplain was there as a resource if you don't subscribe to what's on their uniform you know because in the military they'll be wearing a cross or some other symbol to signify their religion well then i don't want to talk to you because you start off from a i'm trying to think of the term that leo used recently but you start off from with a bunch of presuppositions that i already disagree with so it's just i don't want to engage with you yeah, the biased position, you just, the assumption. And that's the also probably bring up the problem with the military chaplain corps. It's, chaplains are there to theoretically support all different theologies. So I could walk up to a, a, a Muslim chaplain and say, hey, I would like whatever Roman Catholic services, and he's supposed to help arrange that I have a chance to talk to a priest or get it, access to that service. But how many soldiers at the fundamental level look and say, oh, like I could ask that person to put me in contact with any type of religious services I want. But we have these preconceptions like, oh, he's got a cross on his chest. So that's for the Christians. He's got the star David. That's just for the, the Jewish, you know. Yeah. And not to knock the chaplains, because I guarantee that if I had walked up to any of the ranger chaplains I worked with, that they would have stopped whatever they're doing and helped me out. It's just, you know, like I said, whenever they come to it with a worldview that I don't ascribe to already, 
And like what you were saying about stoicism, if you tried to force it on people, it's just it's a non-starter for most people. So tell me more about your in-person group. Like, how did you structure it? How did you pull it together? How often do you meet? Okay, so there is an organization called the Stoic Fellowship, which is great. And it has a lot of big names in the modern Stoic community in it. And essentially, it's set up to help facilitate groups like this, where as I was really digging into this and just kind of reading, consuming it all the time and being really interested in it, I was like, there's got to be people around here. So, you know, I Google Nashville Stoicism. And what I end up finding is the Stoic Fellowship. And they have, even have an interactive map where they show where all the different Stoas or groups are. And I, there was nothing in Nashville. And even though I was still relatively new to the philosophy, I was like, you know, whatever, I'll see. So I click start a new one. And they sent me a starter pack. They hooked me up with a mentor and gave me some information. So basically what we do now, I've been doing it for over a year now, is we meet once a month. And I'll just pick or I'll ask someone to give me an idea, some sort of core doctrine or concept. And then I'll work through Seneca, Marcus Aurelius, Epictetus, and I'll find a few different passages to support that idea or to help flesh it out. And we'll just read through them one at a time and just kind of talk about it, like what what do p different people pull from it. You know, it's not like a lecture. It's more like a group discussion. And because I have the most uh, background, the most understanding of the Stoic philosophy, when people are talking, I, I might interject and be like, hey, you know, this that idea that you're saying is actually one that comes from this thinker and or tie it back into the philosophy. But generally, I mean, we get together at a brewery. We have a couple beers, eat some food. I mean, it's a good time. It's very casual. And it's really helped flesh out my understanding of the philosophy, A, from occupying just slightly the position of a teacher, just in that I know more than people, but really I'm just facilitating a conversation, um, but also just in getting great ideas from people. I mean, people think differently. And again, to go back to the idea of community, you know, dialogue is two different people discussing. And I might be boastering the Latin here, but I'm pretty sure dia is two and log comes from logos, which is, you know, universal reason, the Stoic perspective. So you need that dialogue to really make sure that you're not just going down wrong thinking. And starting in January, we actually had a group of people that were really interested in practicing this. So we've all bought Massimo Pigliucci's book. Uh, I don't think I have it with me, but it's a 52 week uh, lesson plan, basically, where it gives you something to work on all week. And I've been doing that with a smaller group of people when we meet uh, in between the two, the major, the once a month meeting. And we'll meet for a little bit shorter time, just kind of chat, talk about how it's going, answer any questions, that kind of thing. But overall, it's been really rewarding. Okay. Yeah. I'll have to think about checking that out and see if I can find one in my own area. Yeah, go to uh, the com. So I know you brought up one book, but is there a kind of a list of books or resources that if someone was interested in getting into kind of the military stoicism aspect that you would recommend? Um, yeah, sure. Um, again, this is a question you asked me earlier. So I actually, I made a list of some books, but to me, I love the meditations. I mean, it's my favorite book. You know, I, I wanted to start with something else that wasn't just like a classic, but I mean, it really is amazing to me. Like every time I read it, yeah, I'll pull something new out of it, or at least it'll remind me of something that I should be thinking about. And oftentimes if I like find myself in a fury or some kind of like strong emotional passion, I can open up the meditations and read a few passages. And I'm like, ah, damn it, man, <laughs> Marcus, you're talking to me. Yep. You knew that I was going to be thinking like this. Um, so the meditations is number one. And then a good book to help bring you up to speed quickly and get you interested in the philosophy would be How to Think Like a Roman Emperor by Donald Robertson. That was really the first book that I read about Stoicism. And he does a good job of mixing in the therapy, like the modern psychotherapy, in with the ancient philosophy and it tells Marcus Aurelius' a story like a story, you know, but based on history. So, I mean, it's just really cool. It fleshes out who Marcus Aurelius it was. It tells you how the philosophy works. It gives you a bunch of really useful tools just to get you going in the right direction. So that would really be, that's close to like number one, really. If, if I were to tell someone, if, if they're mildly interested, check that book out. Then outside of that, I mean, the classics, you know, 
advocated Seneca, things like that. Okay. Okay. I don't know if you ever referenced them, but I always like to tell people to check out Liber, LibriVox.org. It's one of my favorite websites, but it's uh, open domain books that people have recorded. So if you like free audio books, you can find a ton of stoic works that you can just listen to um, if you prefer audio books versus reading. But all the books you, you listed there, uh, obviously not Donald Robinson's book, but you can listen to the meditations and Epictetus and Seneca all uh, recorded. So you ever... And I'll say, you know, I, I listened to How to Think Like a Roman Emperor. I ended up buying a copy, but I gave it to a friend. Um, but I listened to that last year probably three times. And, but the meditations, I would recommend that, you know, if you want to listen to it, that's fine. But it's really something, in my experience, best used where you read a few passages at a time, get to something that really hits home, and then maybe meditate on that and try and take it through the rest of the day and use it as almost like a workbook. Uh, really, but it is, I think if you just blow through and just listen to one passage after another, then you're not necessarily going to really contemplate it in the way that you should. Because, I mean, that's what Marcus was doing. He was writing it down as best as we understand it, or at least I understand. Um, he was, you know, journaling and then using that as a point of focus for the rest of the day or at, in that moment to ground himself in philosophy. Because, you know, a lot of people don't understand Whenever we talk about philosophy today, it's all about these academics and their ivory towers with their, you know, and they're really sold on whatever they already believe. And they're smart enough to backfill it with a bunch of evidence. But in the ancient times, philosophy was a practical therapy for life and like way of life and a religious system and things like that. But Marcus Aurelius was a warrior. He was a warrior emperor that was spent the bulk of his career dealing with a plague multiple wars, I mean, just one extremely stressful event after the other. So whenever people, I've had this in the Nashville Stokes group, they're like, well, he was an emperor, you know, like how it must have been really easy to be a Stoic. But I mean, if you look at the time frame from when he rises to actually being in charge to when he dies, the majority of the time is dealing with one extremely difficult situation after another. Yeah, living on the front lines and fighting barbarians and yeah absolutely yeah. on the river danube talking about you know separating yourself from humanity with rage is similar to seeing s separated arms and heads from bodies i mean you got to imagine that he's seeing that as he's jotting those notes down yeah or just living in an army camp that's infested by plague yeah so with your project um well, i wish you the best of success are you looking for any um i don't know when you're going out there trying to find people to interview, um, are you looking for any type of uh, specialty or um, kind of background that you'd want to go out and interview someone with? It's another good question. Um, so far it's been kind of, I know it when I see it, okay. but my thing, I, I'm interested in people that understand the philosophy or at least are, are trying to understand it as it really is more than just if you're able to take a couple useful tools from it and apply it, then that's that's good. And there's nothing wrong with that. But I, I really am interested in people that are either therapists, veterans. I mean, you don't have to be working actively in stoicism, but you know, taking a real active interest or or what am I trying to say here? Like I said, really pursuing the philosophy and trying to understand it for what it is, so that whenever you're speaking about it, you're trying the best you can to represent it for what it is. So where can the audience find your podcast or reach out and touch you? Uh, well, I mean, I basically just Gmail. I got a Gmail account associated with it, uh, stoicwarfighters at gmail.com. So if you want to reach out to me there, you can. I am on Facebook, but I don't really use it that much. So if you guys, if anybody out there is interested in the project or interested in learning more about stoicism or wants to chat about it, you know, I'll try and help it however I can. You know, for me, this is, I'm, I look at it as a service project to an extent. I mean, it's it's a personal interest, but I don't make any money on this. If anything, I'm you know losing a little bit of money. And I, uh, I just think that it's important that somebody, or at least that I contribute to the ongoing conversation around trying to introduce military and first responders to this philosophy and how useful it is. 
So yeah, just you can shoot me an email if you have any questions or want to reach out to me. Okay. Well, thank you. Any last parting thoughts? Um. Yeah, check out stoicism. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, yeah, I mean, like I said, uh, if it's if it's something you're interested in, how to think like a Roman emperor, audiobook, great way to start and just go from there. Well, I just want to take the, the time to thank you. I really appreciate listening to your podcast. You're doing a great job finding, uh, finding talented or experienced individuals that can really talk from their own experience about stoicism. And it's, it's uh, great to see kind of that ground level effort that really looking the, the shape kind of not only the military, but the larger community to, to me, be more virtuous and live better lives and uh, either learn how to live ethically in the battlefield or learn how to kind of overcome some of the trauma we experience there. So um, my, my greatest thanks to you. I really appreciate it, man. And I appreciate you coming on the show. So uh, hopefully, hopefully we can keep it going. And more than that, hopefully it helps somebody. Oh, yes. So with that, um, I thank you. Um, the audience out there, I invite you to uh, take a look at all of uh, Ryan's great work. Um, please, if you enjoyed this conversation, subscribe to The Evolving Warfighter for more videos uh, on the topic of military history, military, sto or military philosophy. Until next time, focus on your self-development so we can dominate the modern battlefield. Thank you.